Revelation chapter number 7. Revelation chapter number 7 tonight. This is lesson 31, if you're keeping score at home. Lesson 31, and uh, we're going to look at Revelation 7, verses 9 through 13. So let's read those verses together. After this I beheld and lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and under the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshiped God, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation. And have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. And so we'll stop reading right there. So just a little re refresher from where we were last week in Revelation 7. We stopped in verse number 8, I believe it was. And I told you that verse 8 kind of finishes off the tribes that God will call 12,000 witnesses out of each of those tribes. And uh, we made some comments about that last week. And this verse number 8 that we stopped at last week ends the list of tribes mentioned that will participate in the great evangelism of Israel. And so that will be during the tribulation period on earth. And so remember, John is looking towards earth and he is testifying of the things he is seeing from heaven's vantage point. And he's got a front row seat. It's almost like he's... Uh, like Abraham Lincoln in the box seat up above the stage watching what's unfolding beneath him. And so these 144,000 witnesses that we talked about last week, 12,000 from each of the tribes mentioned, will be sent out by God to reach and regather all Israel to their Messiah. And so what is significant about the 12, number 12,000? When the Hebrews back in the Old Testament went out to fight the Midianites... There was a thousand from each tribe sent. Twelve thousand men sent to fight on behalf of God's chosen people, according to Numbers 31, if you want to read about it. Not one man was lost in the battle. All men that were sent out, those one thousand men were sent out. One thousand men from each tribe of Israel were sent out to fight the Midianites, and they all returned safely uh, with nary a scratch. They were sent by God and returned because, because uh, of God's uh, providence over them. And during the time of the tribulation period, the number will be 12 times 12,000 or 12,000 each tribe instead of 1,000. Uh, an even greater number sent out for this task. And what is their task? It's to witness of, of God and of the Messiah. Uh, during the tribulation period. Keep in mind, no Jew is saved simply because he is a Jew. Uh, all men must be saved uh, when they pay, uh, place their faith and trust in Christ as their personal Savior. That's the way folks are saved. Uh, so there'll be no special dispensation for the, for the Israelites to be saved any other way. It'll still be based on God's word and faith in, in their Savior. In the day when the beast makes war with the saints, uh, well, actually the saints, the, 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 the uh, witnesses that God sends out, 12, 12 times 12,000 Jews will all pass safely through that conflict. In other words, when the Antichrist wants to try to stifle this thing from taking place and he goes after these witnesses of God, the 144,000, every one of them will be, uh, will be delivered without harm uh, because they're sealed. Uh, they're sealed and they will survive the mission. What does it mean here as a seal? They're, in other words, they're God's messengers that he is sending out on behalf of his mission for them to reach the Jews. Remember, uh, the tribulation is much about the Jews. 
Uh, it's not so much about Gentiles, it's more about Jews. And so in chapter 7, we see two groups of people that are mentioned. You remember last week when we started in chapter 7, verses 1 through 8, we saw a reference to Jews only. Uh, we won't go back and read all of that because we read it last week, but if you read down through chapter 7, 1 through 8, uh, we see a number of 144,000 that will be sent out. They're sealed and protected. Uh, they're on the earth witnessing during the tribulation period. And they're God's great missionaries during that time. But when we come to verse number 9 of chapter 7, there's a shift in focus. And we see the second group called a great multitude. Look with me at verse number 9 again. After this I beheld in lo a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. No man could number this group. Uh, they're not sealed. Notice that. This group is not sealed. Uh, it just says they're a great multitude. Uh, so because they're not sealed, many will die. Uh, they're seen worshiping. Uh, these are the converts of God's tribulation missionaries, if you will. And uh, they're sharing the kingdom with Israel. And so notice that in this group, many die. Why? Because they're not sealed. They don't have that same protection that God puts on the 144,000. Uh, they're just uh, the result of, of that work. And so from the beginning of national history, it was God's purpose to evangelize the people of the earth through the Hebrew people. When God sent out the Israelites or set them apart from the rest of the Gentile world at the time, remember, before they were Israel, they were Gentiles. Uh, they were all, there was no such thing as Israel until God set these people in place and called them out and, and uh, put his stamp of approval on them. They were just like everyone else. But, but because of that, uh, uh, he, he chose them and, and uh, they became uh, Israel and Jews as we know them today. His plan, though, was in calling them out, was to send them out and they were to testify of God, testify of the God of heaven, and to uh, bring all people to God. And consequently, we know that they failed in their mission. Uh, they, were, they were a stiff-necked people. Uh, they were always happy to do what they were supposed to do when things were going well. But when things didn't go so well, they tended to uh, go astray and God had to chastise them oftentimes and bring them back into the place and the thought processes they needed. And that continued on and on until we got over to the New Testament time and uh, uh, God took them and said, hey, look, you guys have had your opportunity. I'm going to put you on the back burner and I'm going to now give the mission of reaching the world for my name to the Gentiles, consequently the church. And so uh, that's what happened throughout that history. But from the beginning, it was always God's design to have the Jews be those spokespeople for himself, uh, for the people on earth. Uh, the Jews were to dwell alone, be blessed, and then be a blessing. He called them out, said, I want you to be separate, but I also want you to be a blessing to the other people. Numbers chapter 23, verse 9 says, For from the top of the rocks I see him, and from the hills I behold him, lo, the people shall dwell alone, speaking about the Jews, and shall not be reckoned among the nations. He wanted them set apart uh, for the specific purpose of reaching uh, the world. He wanted them to be different. You know, we see a lot of times in our churches that uh, God wants us separated from the world. He, he doesn't want us blending in with all the world's devices and all the world's uh, way of doing things. He wants Christians to be separated. He wants them to be uh, different, uh, a peculiar people. And so the Jews were, the, were, the, were the, the typology, if you will, for we Christians of today. So who are the people? They were the Jews in Revela or excuse me, Numbers 23.9. So when we come to Revelation 7, chapter 7, verse 9, uh, we see these words, and after this beheld a glow, a great multitude, which no man could number. And you see, he lists them off. All nations and kindreds and people and tongues stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. So who is this great multitude? 
This is not the same group that we see in Revelation chapter 4 and Revelation chapter 5. Uh, the group in Revelation 4 and 5 uh, uh, mentioned there uh, is different. Uh, it's not the same group. The group in Revelation 7 9 is seen standing before the throne. But if we were to go back over to Revelation 4 and verse 5, uh, they're sitting. There's a difference. Why is there a difference? Because uh, the, the church has been raptured away and they've been brought into the presence of the throne room of God in heaven. And they are, they are given a, a special treatment because of why? Because they chose by faith to trust God uh, uh, and, and put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Israelites have not, most of them have not done that. So if they're going to uh, go into the tribulation period and be witnessed to by the 144,000, uh, they're not going to get the same uh, treatment uh, as, as, the, as the, uh, the church. In other words, those coming out of tribulation will not get the same benefits that those of us who are in the church, who have already put our faith and trust in Christ and uh, are, are doing, uh, Lord willing, what we're supposed to be doing in the now and now and the preparation for the judgment seat and all those things. But this group in Revelation 7, verse 9, if you look at it again, I beheld it was no man could number of all nations, kindreds, peoples, and tongues, stood, see that? Stood before the throne. If we go back to chapter 4 and 5 and reread those passages with regard to the group that's in the throne room of heaven, you're going to see them sitting. That's a difference. And that's on purpose. Number two, this group uh, mentioned here in Revelation 7 and verse 9, uh, not only uh, is, is, is uh, uh, it says there, uh, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But the other thing that's missing, if you compare the two groups, the group in four, uh, chapter 4 and chapter 5, they have crowns and thrones given to them. Okay? This second group, the great multitude coming out of tribulation, they don't get those things because of the difference. God has put a distinction between the two groups. The first group received their rewards, listen, before the tribulation began. The second group is going to have to wait for theirs, and they're not going to be the same. The first group were able to escape uh, the, the, the hour of trial uh, by putting their faith and trust in Christ. The second group mentioned here did not and had to be brought out of great tribulation. You know, it's almost like if you think about it, when you, when you have children and uh, you ask your children to do something for you, let's say you have three kids and you ask them all to do the same thing. Maybe two of them do what you ask them immediately. The other one kind of drags their feet and, you know, sort of, uh, does it rebelliously, if you will, or doesn't want to do it and kind of gives you a bunch of gruff back and so on and so forth. Let me ask you this. Would you reward both children, the one that's obedient and the one that's disobedient or practically rebellious? Would you re reward them the same? I hope not. And so we're seeing the, the similar thing here unfold with this group uh, that uh, is coming out of great tribulation. Here's another interesting thing. Many of these folks coming out of tribulation... Uh, uh, they're coming out. They're they're coming out of the the kings and the priests, and then now they're uh, they, many of them were kings and priests uh, in the world, but now they're simply servants. Okay, another distinction made here. Uh, so he says, uh, after this, beheld low, great notes, uh, kindreds, tongues, and stood before the throne, clothed with white robes, palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, "Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne." And unto the Lamb. So they're standing before the throne of God. The Father sits on his throne in heaven. Christ sits at his right hand. And so in Revelation chapter 6, just flip back there with me one second. I want to show you one verse of scripture. We'll tie it back together here in just a second. Revelation 6. Look at verse 16 and verse 17. Uh the Bible says, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of his wrath is come. Who shall be able to stand? 
You see that? So Revelation 6, verses 16 and 17 is speaking about those who are in the tribulation. And uh, there's only going to be a few that come out because many will be killed. For the great day of this wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? Don't think for one second, and we, we need to make this clear to those that we witness to, that they can put off making a decision for Christ now with the hopes that they're going to go into the tribulation and everything's going to work out for them. Because there's a great chance that they won't make it. Okay? 1 Samuel chapter 16 Look over there with me for a second. Hold your finger in Revelation uh, chapter 7. Let's flip back to the Old Testament. Uh, 1 Samuel 16. Show you an example here of, of what we're saying with reference to the difference between the two groups. 1 Samuel 16. And this is a... This is a uh, this is a principle that is oftentimes misunderstood in the Bible... 1 Samuel chapter 16, look at verse 21. The Bible says, And David came to Saul and stood before him. You all see that? And he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to, sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. We cannot, listen, we cannot earn favor to be saved. You don't go to heaven and you're not born again because God favors you. But after you're saved, you can come into the favor of God. In other words, God's blessings are reserved for those who are obedient. God never blesses disobedience. And that's, that's, a, uh, you know, that's a, uh, a misunderstood thing in Christianity today. Many people believe that I can trust Christ as my Savior, be born again, but then I can do whatever I please to do, and God's going to still give me everything. Doesn't work that way. If that were true, God would not be just. Because he would be blessing disobedience, in other words. God is never going to bless us when we are disobedient to his word. Now, he's not going to throw us out of the family. Just like you wouldn't take that child that I was mentioning a few minutes ago and say, well, because you didn't do what I told you to do immediately and you gave me all kinds of back talk because I wanted you to do it, uh, I'm not going to toss you out of the family. Amen? Still your child... Those that are born again are still God's children, but there's a, there's a price to pay when we are disobedient. And we need to understand that. And David is a good example here. It's a, it's a type, if you will, in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, verse 21-21. Uh, two times we see uh, the word favor here mentioned. And so David was able to earn Saul's favor. Saul was the king, remember. And uh, he found favor in King Saul's eyes and was allowed, listen, to stand in the king's presence. You see that? This signified that David had found favor in the sight of the king. Here this great multitude is allowed to stand in the presence of the king of kings. They're not allowed to sit, but they're allowed to stand. The group that's allowed to sit is the ones that were born again during the church age, that were raptured away. They were God's obedient children, if you will, doing what they were supposed to do when they were supposed to do it. But this group is different. This great multitude also, notice it says in verse 9, Revelation 7 verse 9, there's something else different about them. Um, at the very end of the verse, uh, they're clothed with white robes. We talked about that a few weeks ago. And palms in their hands. You see that? Palms are used in Scripture to express joy oftentimes. 
this multitude has come through tribulation and their deliverance is complete. So you can imagine that they're pretty excited. I, I can't even imagine what it would be like to be alive in the tribulation and be able to survive. I think I'd be pretty happy too, wouldn't you? After you see what goes on. So this multitude has come through tribulation. Their deliverance is complete. And when the Feast of Tabernacles was celebrated in the Old Testament, as a sign of joy, the people waved palm branches. After their captivity, though, they, they made huts of palm branches. In other words, when the Israelites came out of captivity, they made huts of palm branches, and there was great gladness in the camp. When the Lord rode into Jerusalem, remember, he was also granted with, with folks waving palm branches and laying palm branches on the ground and, and all that. So palm branches is sort of a, a symbol, if you will, of, of folks who are happy and joyful because of what ha has happened uh, to them. In Ezekiel chapter 40, actually Ezekiel 40 and 41, we also find there that the millennial temple that will be rebuilt in Jerusalem, it's not there as this day, as of now, but it will be rebuilt prior to the millennial reign of Christ. It will be rebuilt completely in its entirety. And we find that palm trees will be the only wood that's used in building of that temple. So palm trees have a significant uh, have a significant uh, part to play in the future prophecy of our Lord. Look at verse 10. The Bible says, He cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. This is still, remember, the Father on the throne. This is pointed out each time, for the throne of glory promised the Son is on the earth. Christ will sit on earth in that millennial temple, his throne will be there. He will sit on the throne of David, his father, the, the Bible says. Uh, many times we see that uh, talked about. But, but God the Father is on the throne in heaven. And uh, 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 each time we see the throne of glory promised the Son, is, it's on the earth at Jerusalem, according to, that's Matthew 19, verse 28, if you want to, uh, well, I, let me read it to you. Matthew 19, 28. The Bible says, And Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that ye which have followed me, that's, the, that, that's, that's us, the, the, uh, the, the uh, Christians, in the regeneration, that's when we were born again, when the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory, which is in Jerusalem, in the millennial temple, ye also, listen, shall sit upon twelve thrones, Judging the twelve tribes of Israel. So in this particular verse, he's speaking to his apostles. All right, but Christians are on the same uh, on the same uh, wavelength, if you will, as as the apostles. Just they're given a specific role to play. Remember, I think it was last week or the week before. I said that uh, the twelve apostles will judge Israel. That's what he just said in in uh, Matthew nineteen verse twenty eight. They're going to be sitting on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. And uh, the church, that's, the, that's us, uh, those of us who are part of the church, we will have, in the millennial kingdom, we will have judgment over the nations. That's what the Bible teaches us. So, think about this. If we're going to have... Uh, the ability to judge the nations with the Lord. You know, there's many verses that says that we will rule and reign with Christ. You, you, know, you know that, right? Most of I think have heard that before. We'll rule and reign with Christ. But let me just tell you, if you're not doing the things that you're supposed to be doing now, and you're one of those rebellious kids that doesn't want to follow the Lord, doesn't want to follow the Lord's word, wants to just get by and ride their salvation into heaven just for themselves in a selfish manner, you're not going to be ruling and reigning. You're going to be a servant like this other group that we're talking about tonight. See, there's a distinction. There's, there, there's a benefit to serving God according to the word of God now. See, what, what, what happens many times in, in Christians' minds and hearts is, uh, you know, they, they go through their Christian life after salvation, and maybe in the beginning they're excited because they're born again, and they're in the family of God, and it's, everything's great, and... But as time goes on, the, 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 the excitement and the joy and all the benefits for being a Christian and coming out of the, the sinful world that you were a part of before being born again 
uh, sort of that, that uh, the, the excitement tends to fade a little bit over time because we're not keeping the relationship sweet. It's like a man and a woman. When you get married, uh, you know, you're all giddy with each other when you get married and they're in the honeymoon, so to speak. But after you've been married for 20, 30, 40, 50 years, all of a sudden what? Things kind of become, you know, a little bit more uh, mundane and, you know, not so much excitement. And, you know, I know you all can't relate to any of this, but, but, but the tr that's the way things are a lot of times. And so what, what we're seeing here is God is making a distinction between the group that did what they were supposed to do and the group that did not. And uh, because they're God's people, he's going to give them an opportunity uh, to be saved uh, or to, you know, to be part of the millennial kingdom in the future. But listen, there, there's a pr they're going to pay a price for not doing it now. Okay? Does that make sense? So, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 32... Uh, there's also the throne of David, it's referred to, but that's the throne that Christ will sit on in the millennial kingdom. And the Bible says, from his throne, he shall judge the nations, separating the sheep from the goats. Okay? So, in, in this place, that shall be enjoined by, enjoyed by the overcomers. By the way, if you got saved, you're an overcomer. Okay? But... Being saved as an overcomer doesn't mean you get saved and you sit back and do nothing else. you got to keep keeping on, right? There's a lot of Christians today who get discouraged because of what's going on in our world. They get depressed, they get discouraged, and they just can't keep keeping on and they'd rather be dead. But the Bible encourages us in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 when you look at all the churches what did he tell them at every one of the churches at the very end of the, of the, 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 the scripture with regard to the church? Uh, he, he basically uh, said, like, uh, for instance, uh, uh, verse 17 of chapter 2, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the hidden manna, and will give him a white stone, in the stone a new name, written which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth it. That's the church at Pergamos. The church at uh, Thyatira. He that overcometh and keepeth my works unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations. You see that? There's a, there's a benefit to doing what we're told. Just like when you were growing up, there was a benefit to doing what your father said to do. And when you, I don't know about you, but I know with my father, if I didn't do what I was supposed to do, I didn't get benefits. I, I didn't get a participation trophy. And that's the way the world is today. Everybody wins. No, that's not reality. You got to do what God says to do. Jesus Christ does not sit on his throne, the heavenly throne again, until the new heavens and the new earth are put into place in Revelation chapter 22. We'll get to that later. In the interim, he'll sit on his earthly throne in Jerusalem during the millennial kingdom. So let's go back to... Uh, Revelation 7, look uh, with me at verse uh, number 10. Again, salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne. That's God the Father and unto the Lamb. Uh, this song of deliverance uh, that, they, that these folks sing in Revelation uh, uh, chapter 7, verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb. And all the angels, verse 11, stood round about the throne, about the elders, and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped uh, worship God. This song of deliverance is very different from the praise of the church. If we were to go back to the beginning of Revelation and look at some of the, the, the verses there with regard to the church in heaven, uh, it's a very different song. Uh, different from the song of the elders in proclaiming the worthiness of him who is slain. 
uh, and no, Re- Revelation 5 verse 9 says, and hath redeemed us, this is the church now, has redeemed us to God by the blood out of every, uh, out of every uh, kindred. But in Revelation 5, 9, uh, or excuse me, 7 verse, uh, uh, Revelation 7 verse 9, the focus is on those who have come out of tribulation. There, there's a difference. These victors in Revelation 7, uh, chapter 7, verses 9 on down through, there's nothing said on these folks about the blood or of redemption. Remember, as Christians, we were redeemed, bought back by the blood of Christ. These folks are coming out of tribulation uh, because of the witnesses that God is sending out to reach the Israelites. These are folks that are going to benefit from that because they're alive on the earth during the tribulation. Simply this group in verse, verse uh, number 10 and 11, basically just, they just describe their, their benefit to God on his throne and under the Lamb. But when we come to the end of, of, of this chapter, we'll see more of that. I don't know if we'll get all to it tonight, but... So why this outburst of praise from this group? Notice verse 10, it cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne unto the Lamb. You know, words are so important in the Bible. Uh, Why this outburst of praise? I I think I touched on this a couple of minutes ago, but it, it, it arises from their circumstances. You know, I've heard people say this before. You know, if you lived a fairly regular sort of life prior to your salvation, when you got saved, it was good and you're, you're thankful for it. But when somebody gets saved out of a life of drugs and crime and all kinds of other things, you know, is it a little different for them? I think it is. You know, growing up as I did, I grew up in a really, you know, an average home and, you know, my father worked and, you know, raised us and all those things, taught us to respect authority and all that. And I I didn't come off the streets as a little thug or a criminal, you know, so I don't even know what that kind of life would be like. But when God saved me, he, he saved me from my sin, like he does every believer, but it's easier for somebody like me to probably grow a little complacent than it would be for somebody coming out of a real bad background. Do you understand what I'm saying? Maybe it's appreciated a little bit more if that's the case. So why this outburst of praise? Remember I said a minute ago, these folks are coming out of the tribulation. They're, in other words, they're, I can use that phrase, they're escaping with the, by the skin of their teeth. The throne which they're standing before is, is not one of mercy, but of righteousness. And the Lamb is here seen, not as slain for them, but He's seen here for His judgment. Remember, at this point in time, Christ is the one bringing the judgment. But when He came the first time and He died on the cross, He brought us what? Grace and mercy. But now He's bringing righteousness and judgment on all the unbelievers. You know, I wonder during the tribulation period if if people will still have the hard-heartedness that we see today. I'm sure there'll be some that will shake their fist at God as they're dying or being destroyed. But here we, we see these folks, they're uh, they're dealing with the with the Lamb of God, Christ, but they're dealing with Him not as a as a saving uh, as a Savior, but they're dealing with Him as a righteous Judge. You know, as the souls that we read about a couple of weeks ago, the souls under the altar prayed that their blood might be avenged. So these souls have been crying for deliverance through the destruction of their adversary. You can imagine they're probably losing friends and family members all around them. And Christ is coming to them uh, and, and with, uh, for righteousness and judgment, but 
they're going to experience a little deliverance from the earthly tribulation and establishment, and, and, and they'll receive a, a, an earthly blessing, if you will, because they'll escape the, the, uh, the, the uh, terrible judgment that God is going to pour down on the earth during the tribulation period. And so, notice verse 11, it says, All the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and the four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God. So the, as the events unfold on earth, the elders, the four beasts, the angels... They fall on their faces in heaven's throne room and worship God. But the angel's response is similar to the cry of this multitude, comparing, comparing it with the song of the angels in chapter 5. We no longer find the lamb that was slain to be the prominent object. Now he's a righteous judge bringing judgment and destruction on unbelievers. No doubt Christ as a man uh, takes the kingdom by this title but here however the subject is not the title but the fact of the righteous judgment that's unfolding the angels give praise that God's kingdom is finally established and in and is and manifest in power and glory remember the tribulation period leads up to uh, at the very end of the tribulation it's going to lead up to the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth and so while this is unfolding during the seven years of tribulation, uh, you know, we're sort of getting a, a snapshot of those seven years here in these verses. But the angels give praise that God's kingdom is finally established and Christ is ruling and reigning. He's the righteous judge. No more cheating. No more stealing. No more false, uh, false witnessing. Christ will not stand for any of that. You know, we see things happen today and, you know, why would, we, why would we be surprised about anything today? But when Christ is ruling and reigning and he's, right, he's ruling uh, uh, from his throne in Jerusalem, everything will be exactly as it's supposed to be. He won't get tired and say, well, you know, just, just let it go. No, everything that's not right will be dealt with swiftly. Look at verse 12. The Bible says, saying, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Here is a resume of who God is in all of this. In all of his infinite glory, what do we see? God is worthy of his blessings, he's worthy of glory, he's worthy of wisdom, thanksgiving, honor and power and might. All of the things, listen, that men today like to take credit for themselves. How many times have you heard somebody say, well, that's all of me. I did that. But really in truth, God is the only one who's worthy of all those things that I just mentioned. Revelation 7.12, we see the things mentioned. When we compare the, the list of these things ascribed uh, to God the Father, and then we compare the things ascribed to the Son, we notice there's a little difference between the things ascribed to God the Father here and, and Christ the Son. Uh, the Father, uh, we see, uh, uh, let's see, we see here... Uh, with, uh, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power. Instead of power with the, with the Son, we see strength. The word strength is there. Uh, the two differences, uh, might and strength, are different. Thanksgiving and blessing. Uh, there's, you know, so there's a little difference in the list, again, uh, on the person of, 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 of God the Father and, and Christ in their, in their current position here, if you will. Also mentioned with regard to Christ is the word riches. Every time you see the word riches in the Bible, uh, riches is mentioned 98 times in the Bible, but never associated to God the Father. It's always associated to Jesus Christ, the Son. He's the one that brings the riches, uh, the riches of his glory. And we see verses like that. God cannot be, why is that true? Because God cannot be made any, God the Father cannot be made any richer by anything here. Because he created it all. So why in the world would he be made richer by his own things? You see? He can't be made richer 
uh, by anything associated with his creation since he is the creator of all things. Revelation 7 verse 13, one of the elders answered saying unto me, what are these which are arrayed in white robes? Remember we saw that there up at the, uh, let's see, that was up in verse uh, number 9. So the, th so the elder is asking a question, uh, what are these which are arrayed in white robes and whence came they? So here we see a question posed by one of the elders. Who are these which are arrayed, arrayed in white robes? We're going to tell you more about them, but we're going to wait until we get to chapter 14. Because it's going to bring those folks back into view again in chapter 14. And so for tonight, this meeting is adjourned. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for another opportunity. Lord, we know that this is uh, complicated stuff. Uh, not because, Lord, you don't want us to understand it. It's because we, in our infinite, our, our, our finite minds, we can't grasp a hold of all these things like we ought to. But Lord, we do pray that you give us the Spirit of God to guide us and direct us into all truth. And Father, uh, as we study these things, uh, Lord, uh, we learn one thing and we, question, we, 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 we find 12 other questions. And so, Father, we need your help to be able to understand what you'd have us to see here. Uh, we, we know it all makes sense because you're the author and you don't ever uh, write confusing things for the purpose of being confusing. But, Father, tonight we need to, to ask your help as we study in the coming weeks to... Uh, sort of bring some of these things into more clarity so that we can be blessed by what we learn and understand about thy word. And so, Father, we help, we, uh, we pray tonight that you'd help us and that you'd give us uh, what we need to, to be able to understand. And help us, Father, we pray, and as we leave this place tonight, that you'd bring us home safely tonight and bring us back again at the next appointed time with your uh, grace and mercy. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.